In 2005, nine Australians were caught attempting to export heroin from Bali. Miran Sukumaran and Andrew Chan were cast as the ringleaders. Muran was dubbed the kingpin and Andrew the mastermind. I don't think I was really going where in life and I don't think, uh, yeah, I just don't think I was, I, I was really heading anywhere. Whatever happened to Chappelle Corby happened to me. They were pretty unimpressive. They were typical young offenders. We had a lawyer then. He said 10 years, maximum. I was just thinking, 10 years, could live with that. <laughs> I thought to myself, I could live with it. It's pretty shocking, pretty confused. You don't think that you're gonna get caught and a huge scandal like this is going to happen. We start with breaking news in Bali 9 member Andrew Chan. Sukumaran has lost his bid for presidential clemency. Indonesia's Supreme Court rejected his final appeal. Sentenced to death by firing squad for his role in attempting to traffic heroin from Bali to Australia in 2005. All legal appeals against his death sentence have he failed. Will be put to death in the next round of executions. The clock is ticking and it's pretty close to midnight and we're in a very bad situation. You don't get to hear people in the prison doing so well and that is what kept us going all these days. Now at the end of the 10 years, they want to execute them. How do you take it? It's not fair. In 2010, reporter Mark Davis met Muran and Andrew. It was the first time anyone had been given permission to bring a camera into prison to film their story. <sighs> You're not looking so good. Yeah, but I'm going to attempt to do a bit of sport today to sweat it out. Yeah. I never saw myself as like a bad person or something like that. As I look back at myself now, I see I was stupid back then, yeah, but I never thought of myself as a bad person. Morning. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, <laughs> all right, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Just got up. Yeah. yeah. All right, I suppose. Hardly ever spent any time with my mum and dad, whatever, really, or my brothers and my sisters. Yeah, we didn't. We just didn't really get along. I, I just, I was pretty much like the black sheep of the family, to be honest. Yeah, you know, I've learnt to, to realise my brother, my umbrella's my own best friend. He, he'd always stick his nose in, even though I turn around sometimes and go, "It's none of your business." You know, I know that he only wanted wanted to look out for me. He used to think he was a prick, but... <laughs> but it's true, I mean, I did. I used to think he was... I, I envied him, but uh, <laughs> he knows that, because I told him. Oh, OK. And some people say, well, did you know? Well, personally, if I knew he'd, he, he was up to something like that, I, I'd probably... It'd probably be more satisfaction for me to probably strangle him myself to death than to go through this uh, pain and agony with him right now. I abused drugs myself. I was a drug user. So, um, you know, I, I, I know what it feels like to to be, you know, one of them them junkies walking on the street. I guess. Australians look at this as a death penalty issue, which it is. In Indonesia, it's been seen as a drugs issue. Tapi ya tentu masyarakat Australia harus memahami juga kesulitan yang sedang dihadapi bangsa Indonesia dengan masalah narkoba ini. Itu benar-benar luar biasa ini jauh lebih dahsyat akibatnya dibandingkan dengan kejahatan terorisme. Most of the drugs consumed in Indonesia are manufactured in Indonesia. My clients were attempting to export drugs out of Indonesia. The kind of people that my clients represented, even on the worst day, are really peripheral to the essential problems that the Indonesians are facing. But no one's talking about that in Indonesia. There was a change of government, a change of president last year, and President Widodo has made it clear that the um, drug trade in Indonesia is a national crisis, in his, his words and that he intends to take a very hard line. In December, the president said, I'm going to have 64 people on death row for drug offences, all of them executed. 
untuk meminta gerasi. Begitu masuk ke meja saya sudah saya sampaikan, tidak ada yang saya beri pengampunan untuk narkoba. Jokowi is a weak president. He has not got a, a majority in the legislature. He is struggling to put one together. He is struggling to get his agenda through. As the political pressure on him mounts, and it's extraordinarily high right at the moment, there really is a political crisis in Indonesia. For him to be tough is all the more important. Right now, there's a kind of sudden rush to execute. They'll be put to death in the next round of executions. Indonesia has executed about 30 people in perhaps, say, 20 years. It's not a country which executes much at all. Under the former president, there were no executions between 2008 and 2013. Not only have they resumed executions, but they are actually saying that really they want to embark on a mass killing. There's no other way to put it. Five people a month, uh, 58 people by the end of the year. That would be a complete transformation of Indonesia's practice in the past and would move it away from what seemed to have been a, a slow possible path towards abolition to putting it in the brackets of the top executors in the world. Did you consider that you're in a country with the death penalty, though? Um, no, you don't think too much of that. I didn't anyway. Uh, you know, most people think, yeah, you would, but I didn't. It was, it, it, more or less for me, it was just, oh, quick, quick payday, that's it. And yeah, I did have a, I did have a role in it. You know, truth of the matter is, um, you know, I, I, I did commit a crime and, you know, Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously paying. I'm, I'm obviously paying the price for it. There's a a huge risk, whether you recognise it or not. You must have felt there was a risk. What was the reward? I was hoping to buy a car, hoping to start a business. These, those are sort of the things. You know, like I, I didn't see like myself working in a mailroom for the next 50 years of my life. I thought, no, I can't do this. And you know, you see all these people and like nightclubs with nice BMWs and nice Mercedes and you know there's always chicks there and you know they're always buying drinks for everybody and you think fuck you know how do how do you do this on a mailroom salary yeah it could be worse it could be worse so I suppose I'm thankful that every day I, I actually get to wake up. As you know, I'm, I'm studying and um, you know, a lot of people might see that. They say, oh, you know, there's probably no use towards it. Uh, look where you're staying, but you know, I believe if you want to try and build yourself up to something, you know, you got to start somewhere. You got to start today and, you know, maybe tomorrow won't exist. Or what did you say to your mum? She'd worked uh, particularly hard all her life. She was proud of you. Yeah. What do you say to someone like uh, that when you're I in just a keep saying I'm sorry. I don't know what I can do actually to make it all better, but. Yeah. last two weeks a number of constitutional court judges who sat on the death penalty case in 2007 examining the law concerning this issue have said that our clients should not be executed because of the time that has passed because of the rehabilitation because of the justice of the case death sentence is violates the constitution you know the highest law in this country is constitution karena kita harus membangun ya uh, apa nama itu membawa pencerahan bagi dunia bagi kemanusiaan keputusan yang terakhir itu menolak artinya tetap menganggap pidana mati konstitusional ya saya ikut saja karena saya ketua actually I'm so sad and I cry about that. I cry about that. Jim Lee Ashadiki played a decisive role in retaining the death penalty, but 
he was also responsible for inserting a particular phrase that the government should grant clemency for prisoners who after 10 years show reform. Today, Jim Lee is now with Leitcher in speaking out and other judges are joining their ranks. Bahwa pidana mati itu menurut saya dan menurut dua teman yang lain tidak lagi sesuai dengan perkembangan uh, standar kemanusiaan universal. I have a dream. I have a dream. One day our country have to abolish abolish the death penalty. It's made me look at it as a Hey, maybe one day I won't be able to get up. One day I won't, you know, one day I prob possibly won't have the chance to get up. So uh, it's put me on a different angle to look at things differently, to look at things differently. Probably to cherish life a lot more than what I did. So where are we off to? Going down to the church service. It's hard to give a brief answer to how they've helped other prisoners. Andrews counseled them, pulled them out of drugs, pull them out of trouble, uh, help them get their lives in order. It brings me a fair bit of comfort and, uh, yeah. They basically have grown into fine young men. They live each day with a resolve to do something constructive and good with their time because they don't know how much time they've got. Makes me want to become a better person today and not tomorrow. I live every day as it comes. I live it though as my last. I'll make sure I've lived a good, good life. Sure. Uh, that I'm happy with anyway, really. That's our English service, and generally I run, I run worship with Anwar right there, the, the guy that's singing right there. One of the things that is kind of enjoyable, if slightly macabre, is that the boys have plenty of death row jokes. All prisoners have jokes about their predicament in prison. So you gonna... want to see some of the designs? Myra, at some point, was being called a kingpin in the media. And so when he began making T-shirts, I think he invented a label. What's the, what's the brand? Uh, kingpin or Kingpin Clothing. That's your, that's your name? Yeah. Right? That's what they call me, Kingpin. That's what you were called yeah. in the media too, yeah. right? You were the kingpin. Yeah, and Andrew was the godfather and I was the kingpin. <laughs> it's pretty funny, at first they called me the enforcer, right? Yeah, you were the tough one. You yeah, were the, the enforcer, martial, martial arts, arts expert, expert. Yeah. yeah. I did three, three months of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu training and I became a martial arts expert. Yeah, yeah. Here I am living with my parents still. Like, just how many, how many godfathers do you know still live with their parents? <laughs> <laughs> You've got to have a sense of humour when you're stuck on maximum security death row year after year, waiting to be executed. You either sink or you swim. One of the really frustrating and stupid things about this case is that they have become valuable assets for the Indonesian community. They help Indonesians in prison become better people. The idea of killing two young men who do that day in and day out is just ridiculous. This um, painting, um, I actually wanted to call it the Brady Bunch. <laughs> Are you showing something to your family as well? Is that part of it? Yeah, trying to do stuff that they can be proud of. And are they proud of you? I hope so. So what else are you reading? You've got Dante and Milton. I've got Dante. Two of the all-time greatest books. Yeah. Uh, I've got a couple of books on chess strategy. The only problem is I don't know how to read those books on chess strategy. Yeah. I'm very fond of both of them. They've both become you know, lovely guides. There is a redemption of character there. They're healthy, they're strong, they're wise beyond their years. They're a pleasure to work for. I don't want you to get, you know, too optimistic. And a grand I final. Like a grand final? Like a grand final.
After losing three death penalty appeals, Andrew and Miran lodged a judicial review to challenge their death penalty sentence in 2010. In the night when you go to sleep, you know, the last thing in your mind before you fall asleep is, you know, when is my son going to come home? And as soon as I wake up in the morning, that's what I have, you know, that's what is in my mind. And it was hard for me to sort of go on, on day to day, like cooking and shopping and doing housework. It's really hard. I really sort of miss him. And I just want him back with the family. Just want to see the kids together. She worries a lot about us and, you know, she keeps us close and, yeah, it's been pretty hard on her. Yeah, I think sometimes she struggles to let us do things on our own because she always wants to keep us um, close to her. So. The, the media was pretty much um, telling everyone who he was and they're so loud that whatever we said meant nothing. I feel like people, people have already um, judged Mayu and made a judgement about our family. Emotionally, it's been a big roller coaster ride, you know, from what did we do wrong as a family or, you know, what did mum and dad do wrong uh, bringing him up? Where did he detour? Saya memohon maaf kepada masyarakat Indonesia. Saya juga mohon maaf kepada keluarga saya. Jika saya diampunkan, saya berharap agar suatu hari saya tepat mempunyai keluarga sendiri dan bekerja sebagai pendeta agar saya tepat membimbing anak-anak muda saya masa masih tepat banyak menyumbangkan selama sisa hidup saya ah. Oh, ah, ah, ah. they are changed men the work that they've undertaken in prison the education programs as um, pastors, as painters. They've achieved what prison systems around the world aspire to achieve, that's rehabilitating drug offenders. The prison governors acknowledge that and have testified on their behalf, testified to their good character. Jadi peran serta Saudara Miuran, ya saya merasakan sebagai pimpinan lembaga pemasyarakatan sangat merasakan bahwa itu sangat besar sekali pengaruhnya Kalau nanti pidana mati sampai dijatuhkan kepada yang bersangkutan kemudian sampai dieksekusi, bagi saya pribadi merasakan uh, kasihan, ya spiritual saya mengatakan apa tidak bisa diampuni. That was a very gutsy thing to do. He was fighting his employer. His employer is the state of Indonesia. The state of Indonesia was cross-examining him, and he was saying, "I'm here to tell the truth in full uniform. This is what I say." Convicted drug traffickers Andrew Chan and Muran Sukamaran can only have their lives saved by presidential clemency. President Joko Widodo has just ordered that no effort be spared to secure the release of more than 200 Indonesians on death row around the world, but will not be moved on the executions of Andrew and Muran. <laughs> Oh, I, I'm so sad, yeah. I'm so sad because that means the government is against the constitution. The president is not above the constitution. Politicizing executions and the death penalty or using haste and speed to get people executed is a sure sign that something is going badly wrong and that there is another agenda here. No country has more successfully or aggressively been able to save its own citizens from death row.
They've saved nearly 200 people in the last three and a half years, and they've still got about another 200 on death row scattered around the world. Yet they won't show the same mercy to Australian citizens who are facing death row in Indonesia. I've made this point time and time again, and uh, it's a confusing message for us to have to accept. We have to optimistic that, that there's always a light at the end of the channel. Yeah. I just put myself in the shoes of the families. Their sons, their brothers are facing death by firing squad. I kept thinking about the last meeting I had with Mrs. Sukumaran where she hugged me so hard I thought I couldn't breathe and she just sobbed and sobbed. And it just came back to me as I was talking about the impact on the families. When I spoke to the families who were in Jakarta by phone this week, they told me how it was virtually impossible to be strong for each other, how it was unbearable for them to see their sons, their brothers, not knowing if it would be their last time. How could anyone not be moved by their heartbreaking pleas for mercy? Both families have told me they're proud of the men their sons have become. Coming here today was on the basis of mercy and, and begging the president to reconsider. For the last 10 years, we, our families have gone through a lot and only thing that we were able to you know, live with, to see the boys do so many things and to help other people. And we were very proud of it. We want people to know what the boys have actually achieved in nine years more than anything else. You know, I don't want them to be known as, you know, just the people that tried to smuggle drugs. And that's it because that was the story at the beginning, but they've had a, quite a journey in the last nine years. Um, it's been quite an amazing journey for both of them, you know, to have something lingering over your head for the last nine years and to turn out the way they both have um, is a testament to them both. What hope? do you have of, what, of your final chances? Yeah, I hope to get a life sentence. I hope not to be executed. What sort of life would it be uh, for you? Um, it'll be a life. Better than no life? Yeah. <laughs>